Hi there, everyone. Welcome to CenterZip's monthly webinar. I'm Jill Hurston, the Marketing Director at CenterZip, and I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Pankaj Jain. He is our VP of Software Development Services. Go ahead, Pankaj. Thanks, Jill. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, uh, let me go over some housekeeping notes. During the webinar, uh, feel free to ask any questions through the chat box on, on the, your GoToWebinar window, which is on the right side. Uh, we will try to get all of your questions answered during the presentation. Uh, and tomorrow you will receive an email with a direct link to the uh, webinar recording and the slides. So with that covered, let me introduce today's topic and speaker. Today's topic, webinar topic is Crash Course Managing Software People and Teams. I am sure like me, <clears throat> your management career started with one day your manager telling me that how great you are as a developer and architect, now go manage the team. Well, don't think you are alone. That is a common story uh, and hopefully today's webinar will help you uh, in managing, get uh, starting, getting your management career started on the right track. So with that, let me, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Ron is a good friend of mine and he's been alternating between consulting and managing software development and product organizations for over 25 years. Almost all of his time is spent in untangling the knots in software development and transforming chaos to clarity. I'm hoping that from today's webinar, you will take away a few best practices that takes most managers years to discover. So now over to you, Ron. Okay. Thank you, Pokash. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I'm Ron Lichty and I'm the author of this book, Managing the Unmanageable, Rules, Tools, and Insights for Managing Software People and Teams. Three weeks ago, Addison Wesley, Pearson, our publisher, released video training based on our book, 10 hours of video training that you can get on, on O'Reilly Safari Network or you can buy from Addison Wesley and Pearson. Um, and we're going to, over the next 40 or 50 minutes, give you a crash course in managing people and teams. Um, 40 or 50 minutes out of those 10 hours that uh, we're going to deliver live. So first, a little bit about me. I've, uh, these are some of the companies I've been with. I was originally a software engineer with one of these companies. I apprenticed myself to a master software engineer in a two-person consulting company, and I wrote software for embedded devices, for compilers, for entertainment, for multimedia, for word processors. And I got a few patents and wrote two books on programming and thought I had the best job in the whole world. Then there's one thing you can't do in a two-person company, and that's manage. And I was curious about what managing a team of software developers would be like. And there was one other company that I was really interested in working for, and that company was Apple Computer. And they came knocking on my door with an offer to come manage a team. And that's what I've done at all the rest of these companies ever since. I've uh, managed programmers and testers and product managers and project managers and pretty much everyone on the product team. I've managed teams and organizations. As a, I've been a manager and a director and a VP of engineering and a VP of products and a CTO. I've managed, I've alternated over the past decade and a half between managing organizations and consulting and training managers and organizations in best practices. As Punkar says, in transforming chaos to clarity and making software development hum. I'm also the co-author of the study of product team performance. Uh, and you can uh, get a look at our results, which some of which are pretty interesting from my website, ronlichty.com. So first, before diving into managing, I want to note that manager is used in multiple ways. We have project managers, we have product managers, we have program managers. Those are all legitimate uses of the word manager. But we've, and, and in fact, we've heard from people in all of those roles who benefited from our books, but 
for, but we wrote our book for people managers, managers who directly manage programmers doing software development. So if your company has performance reviews, you write them. My co-author, Mickey Mantle, and I have talked to and surveyed thousands of software development managers. Fewer than half have had a single day of training in managing people. Only a tiny fraction have had any training in what it takes to manage programmers. Mickey and I are among, are among those statistics. We were both promoted to managers, like Punkaj, after having demonstrated some real skill as programmers. Neither of us had training in management before becoming managers, and our own transitions to becoming managers weren't that easy. So it was one of the drivers behind what Mickey, what led Mickey and me to write this book, and we made it our mission to share some of what we learned after the fact. So let me note, isn't it odd how long we expect programmers to have studied the art of programming and how little we expect managers to have studied the art of managing? One of the other drivers behind what led Mickey and me to write this book were rules of thumb. Mickey and I met over 20 years ago when he headed development at Broderbund, which was at the time the premier name in kids software and graphics software. And I headed development of entertainment software at Berkeley Systems, where we were doing screensavers like flying toasters and fish. Between the two of us, our teams engaged almost as many eyeballs as there were personal computers in the world. 20 years ago, we started having Saturday breakfasts every couple of months and talking about the challenges of managing and sharing rules of thumb that we or others of our peers were using to manage by. I'll share a few rules of thumb as we go along today, so let me define what I mean. Here's a classic. It dates from the 1700s. It's not one of Ben Franklin's, but it was came from one of his contemporaries. Measure twice, cut once. Does that apply in software? The Mars Orbiter people sure wished that they had measured twice before they sent metric units to their English unit programmed satellite, and instead of sending it into orbit around Mars, caused it to crash through the atmosphere and burn up. Here's another classic. Life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Now, I happen to be from a farm in Iowa where I grew up, and, and this one particularly appeals to me. It's, it also dates from the 1700s. And it's also applicable today. It's applicable to managing. Sometimes bad practices are so deeply rooted that you need to route learning and introducing best practices around them. So what we mostly provide in our book, though, are software rules of thumb. And this is the software rule of thumb that got both Mickey and me started with collecting rules of thumb. Brooks Law, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. Fred Brooks said that in the, in the 1970s. And rules of thumb lend credibility. We can tell our executives, hey, I didn't make this up. Fred Brooks told us this truth almost 50 years ago. It was for encapsulating rules of thumb that Mickey and I embarked on writing this book. And in fact, they, there are 300 of them in the center of the book that one reviewer called the creamy center of the book, even though it's printed on gray. Um, and we then wrote nine chapters around that. So what we're going to talk about today is eight elements of managing. And then in case anyone's wondering why anyone would want to manage after all of those eight, I'll address that and any other your questions about managing software people and teams as well. So I want to note while we're looking at this agenda that the first element of managing is different from the next seven. It turns out that most programmers get a very narrow view of what their manager does, of what makes a manager successful. And that narrow view is managing down, which is to say managing your team. It's what most programmers see their managers doing. So it's what most programmers perceive the management job to be. Few see what's truly behind it, and that's the point of the next seven. So I want to share a little of what's behind the curtain, the other parts of what it takes to manage software people and teams. But we're going to begin with talking about managing down. And it's important to consider what makes a manager a great manager to their team. 
So I want to do a quick exercise. Each of you do this on your own. Think about the best manager you've ever had. Run through in your head and close your eyes for a minute. Run through in your head all of the managers you've had and think about who stands out, which one of those managers stands out as truly a great manager. And then think about the skills, the behavior, the finesse, the gifts of greatness that made that manager stand out. And uh, make a couple of notes. You know, uh, write, a, write a couple of stickies or, um, or type into your, your notepad a couple of notes on the word or words that represent those skills, those behaviors, that finesse, those gifts of greatness. The recipe for becoming a great manager from a managing down stand, standpoint. So we've done this, my co-author Mickey Mantle and I have done this with hundreds thousands probably of programmers and managers and the list that the list we come up with includes things like respect and honesty and um, it it's it almost never calls out programming or writing significant lines of code or contributing code to the product. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to share a nugget of wisdom with you here. Nothing undermines your credibility as a manager more completely than pounding on your team all year to get their work done on time and then telling them that you don't have their reviews done because you were busy. Whatever you were busy with likely wasn't managing your people, so you haven't proven to them that they don't matter. You've just proven to them that they don't matter. Good luck motivating them next year. Hi, Ron. Uh, a quick uh, input from one of the audience on your last slide. So uh, the person responded, uh, qualities he thinks of the his manager that came to his mind was delegator, motivator, and cheerleader. Uh, so can, I think everybody understands the delegation and motivation. Can you talk a little bit about cheerleading? Why is that? Is scale of quality important in the management? Management. Yeah. So, 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 let me give you a few more of those that people bring up. They they bring up uh, trustworthiness and patience and being a clear communicator, which is on the order of being a cheerleader, of delivering consistent messages, of being inspiring, which is also along the lines of being a cheerleader, of presenting realistic exploit expectations and being a flexible negotiator and being a good people developer and caring and supporting and being uh, enthusiastic which also goes to that cheerleader thing the interesting thing is is I don't think any one of these so much Pankaj, as the fact that almost no one calls out programming or writing significant lines of code or contributing code to the product as what constitutes a great manager. And yet, when we become managers, here we are thinking, oh, gee, I need to write some program. I need to write some lines of code. I need to contribute code to the product. Our teams count on us for all of these people skills. And it's really, and it's really important to remember that. There's a um, uh, sorry, Ron, uh, just another question on this yeah. one is like uh, you talk about performance review, and I can definitely relate. When I was a developer, and my manager was late in <laughs> providing me reviews or feedback, and then I when I became manager, this was one of the most important thing. So, can you touch a little bit about some organizations have annual reviews, and then some organizations have quarterly review. Some organizations are trying to get away from the performance review thing. So in the agile world, like uh, and in self-describing uh, and self-organizing teams, managing teams, how does this review, uh, uh, traditional reviews, uh, compare to what we are in today's world? Yeah, so I, you know, I want to I want to note that we, had, we could spend an hour talking about reviews and uh, the transition of reviews and the history of reviews, but I want to note that our the people who work for us count on us to give them feedback with regarding how they're doing, and it's and it's really important that we give them that feedback. Now, the review process 
um, has not traditionally been a great process for doing that. In fact, a lot of companies use the review process for stack ranking engineers, which is possibly one of the worst things you can do, given that software development is fundamentally not a an individual sport. It's a team sport. The, um, and one of the other challenges with reviews is that our companies are typically led by people who are once salespeople or marketing people, which are, he, uh, are, are uh, their individual sports. And HR then reflects that by coming along and reviewing people as individuals as opposed to the contribution they make to the team and the and the effectiveness of the team and the and the contribution that each of the team members make. So you know it's, it's uh, we could we could have a long conversation about reviews, but but fundamentally our folks do count on us to give them feedback on how they're doing and to give them and to help them figure out how to get to where they want to go. And we need review processes that fill in for that, and most of us work in companies that we need to be a voice for more sane review policies. So I, think I'm, I think I'm going to leave it, at, I think I'm going to leave it at that, or we'll, we'll get into yep. a whole uh, hour on reviews. Um, so I want to, I want to move on and note that what we've just been talking about, in fact, is part of a great rule of thumb about moving up the management ladder which is that the very thing that makes you successful, that made you successful in your previous role, will get away, get in your way in the next role. Um, this is a rule of thumb that here we're talking just about the change from being a programmer to being a manager. And it's a huge change. What made us successful as programmers was the ability to shut out the world, the ability to uh, as I used to describe it, to climb into the microprocessor and listen to the gates open and close. And now as managers, we need to not just put a welcome mat out in front of our door, but proactively issue an open invitation to the members of our teams to interrupt us. We need to move from introversion to extroversion. Managing, our job isn't just to code. It isn't to code at all. It's to get the best from our coders. It's no longer about personal productivity as much as about making our teams productive, about providing the environment and the resources for our teams to become productive. It's about leverage. And it's also about delegation. And the challenge with delegation is that your programmers will be less skilled than you in one way or often in many ways. And delegation requires that we have a willingness to be frustrated. One way I think about it is I think about it as a continuum of management. And at one end is sink or swim. And at the other end is micromanagement. So with sink or swim, we throw our people into the deep end and it's up to them to figure out how to survive. With micromanagement, we direct every little thing and give them no autonomy whatsoever. What's in the middle of that continuum is what we're really truly called on to do as managers, and that's delegation. Most programming managers, in my experience, start at one of the ends, and it's because it's what the managers that we had did. We have all too few role models for, dele for good delegation, so it's helpful to latch on to a few rules of thumb. And here are a couple that I, that I like a lot. Trust but verify is a rule of thumb that you may be thinking, I've heard that before. Some of you may be thinking, I think I know who said that. And in fact, Ronald Reagan did say it, but he didn't come up with it. He was quoting Vladimir Lenin, who also didn't come up with it. Lenin was quoting what was a Russian proverb. Trust but verify, in fact, provides both the imperative not to micromanage and the essence of delegation. It's about setting expected outcomes for teams. 
And that's and the second rule of thumb that I really like is from Ellen Lefkoff, who at the time was president and CEO of Natopia, and who told me that he learned this rule of thumb from Lou Gerstner when both of them were McKinsey consultants. And that's I inspect what I expect. So let me suggest that view managing as a new learning challenge. It's like learning a new programming language or a new framework. And I urge you to step outside the box, read about managing. I even, I even read, to my great surprise, I even read Harvard Business Review. Remember I said that as a programmer, you have a very narrow view of your manager's job? I had an amazing aha as a manager when one of my management colleagues shared a Harvard Business Review article. Never thought I'd be reading Harvard Business Review. But this article was about Frederick Hertzberg's work in the 1950s which was written up in Harvard Business Review in the 1980s. <clears throat> and it was about being a motivator and not being a demotivator. Hertzberg posited that motivation isn't so simple. There are fewer factors that motivate than people think, a lot fewer. But there are an equal number that while they don't motivate, they'll demotivate when they go negative. And the motivators and demotivators are different factors, and for the most part, not quite all of them. But let me show you one of our charts of Hertzberg's analysis from our book. So this chart is from our book. It, re it resembles Hertzberg's charts, but it's not his. It's what we believe he would have found if he looked just at programmers. The blue bars are motivators. Those are causes of satisfaction. The red bars are demotivators. They're causes of dissatisfaction. So let's walk through these. The blue motivators, these are the things that drive programmers to work harder, to produce more, to be more engaged with their work. And the first one of those, <clears throat> the first one of those is making a difference in the world. And then learning and growing. And then toys and technology. And then recognition and praise. And then having fun. And then upside. And note, this is the first mention of money. And it's the sixth item and it's not money itself it's upside is is um, like stock options and that kind of thing and then interpersonal relationships and then only then eighth is compensation really money and let's look at the demotivators so Hertzberg actually posed them as foundational factors these are the red bars um, and so we have to put them in place first if we don't if we don't put these foundational factors in place it's then that they become demotivators. So these are the reasons that programmers quit. So you might put the words lack of in front of these when you're thinking of them as demotivators. So first of these, the tallest red bar is lack of respect for your supervisor. That's you. That's us. Programmers may not come to work for you because they respect you, but they'll surely consider leaving if they don't. There's a rule of thumb in HR that people don't leave their companies, they leave their managers. And I've experienced that personally when I left a company. The second highest red bar is, is, and the third highest red bar are two that also are high with blue bars, and that's having fun and learning and growing. So lack of having fun and lack of learning and growing will cause people to leave. And then working conditions. All four of these, respect for supervisor, having fun, learning and growing, working conditions, all four of these rely on us as managers to fight for our teams and their needs. And then the fifth one is company policies and administration. So we'll talk about shielding your team in a minute, but here's why it's so important. Again, people don't hire in for working conditions or company policies, but they'll surely leave because of them. And then the next red bar is ethical management. Again, that's us. And only then do we get compens compensation being a demotivator. It's really only if compensation doesn't feel fair that it weighs in as a demotivator. Hertzberg's point was that only when we've eliminated the causes of demotivation can our motivation efforts be effective. So I don't have time today to flip this chart or to show you where it differs from Hertzberg's observation of the general populace, though it's fundamentally pretty close or to share with you the other two theorists around motivation that we find incisive and share a little bit about in our book, Maslow and McGregor, or to dive into the warnings we issue regarding attempting to motivate with money, 
and the number of studies and the years of experience that led us to make those warnings. The point today is to pull back the curtain on where we think you need to go as a manager to shorten your learning curve by pointing you to some key areas to focus on learning. So be careful. Yeah, I, I, Ron, a quick question. Ron, this is Pankaj. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, a quick question. I think that your last slides, uh, I think this is one of the uh, at least great slides. I find very interesting and I think uh, audience are finding uh, interesting as well. Uh, it kind of clearly uh, it's showing us like uh, it's kind of a tricky thing if uh, if you as you start your career in management and you're trying to understand all this stuff the things that are important to the team you are trying to manage uh, are on the left side however at the most of the first line managers or management they seem to forget the right side of things because it has no direct impact to the business but that's one of the big demotivators for the team you are trying to manage so I think it's a very interesting slide yeah we really have to pay attention to the things that are those high red bars and get those in place and only then does doing what the high blue bars suggest help us so I want to jump into uh, a couple of other notes about motivating be careful what you reward here, Jim Highsmith says, uh, who's one of the Agile guys, behavior revolves around what you measure. Kimberly Weefling takes that a little further to note that firefighters who get rewarded carry matches. And here's a question to ponder. Do you define done as coding complete or as features that delight customers? And here's another one that I don't have a bullet for on the slide, but if the rewards go to the heroes, why would you ever see either teamwork or consistent, reliable productivity across the entire development cycle? We really need to think about what it is that we reward. A fundamental piece of motivation was that first blue bar. And that first blue bar was making a difference in the world. It's our job as managers to understand what motivates each of our people and to make the connection, to connect the dots between each programmer's work and the big picture between the, the programmer's project, the product, your customers, and the difference that you're all making in the world. So let me move on to recruiting. Having said all of that, Mickey and I believe that recruiting is a manager's most important job. There's a reason. Hiring is the single most difficult to undo decision that managers make. It's, if you're successful, it makes the rest of your job easier. If you're unsuccessful, it can be a plague on your team for months. An unsuccessful hire can demotivate your team. It can demoralize your organization. It can undermine your leadership. It can incite dissension and strife. It can delay or derail your deliverables not to mention how hard it is to get rid of bad hires. I've known managers who put off recruiting, whose hires drag on, and there's a reason to give it priority. I learned this at Apple. There's something called a hiring window. As company results and outlook and the economy change, the employee numbers that look acceptable change as well, and they can cause the hiring window to suddenly open or to slam closed. It turns out this applies to companies of all sizes. When you get permission to hire, it's rarely forever. The hiring window can slam shut without notice. Even when it's closed, you need to keep recruiting because that hiring window may suddenly open and the gap may remain open for a frustratingly short time. Or you need to keep recruiting while the window is closed because you may be able to make an opportunity hire you may find someone who is so compelling that you can drive senior management to support your hiring them despite the window being closed. So there's a rule of thumb that we use, which is always be recruiting. You need to create a personal database of prospects. You need to look at resumes when you're not hiring. You need to network, network, network. You need to be out in the community networking. You need to be prepared for your need for programmers to change. You need to be prepared for the hiring window to open. 
you need to be prepared to get your hires made before it slams closed. The biggest reason managers put off hiring is the fear of making a bad decision. So I was several companies in, I was beginning to, into my management career, I was beginning to gloat about how good my hiring ability was when I made a truly bad hire. Everyone, there is, there is sooner or later, no manager who has a perfect record. But the, it's the biggest reason managers put off hiring is that fear of making a bad decision. Use that fear to make you work harder, not delay your process. Use checklists like those that are among the tools we provide with our book to ensure and double check your decision and know that whether it's sooner or later, we'll all get fooled once in a while. And as a result, one of your roles as a manager is to handle problem employees. Whether you hired them or you inherited them, you will sooner or later have a problem employee. Everyone thinks there are just two approaches and they get dealing with problem employees and that they differ only by what HR makes you do, those two being to fire the person or to put them on a performance plan. So it was a really important learning for me that there's a step way before the firing stage and well before the performance plan stage That's that is sometimes called intervention. You need to intervene early. Intervention is a process. I learned it from, from my coach, Marty Brownstein, who wrote the book on it. Intervention takes a lot of preparation. It involves a meeting that you schedule for an hour but block your calendar in the room for half a day and spend probably two days preparing for. It requires follow-up regular ongoing check-ins and check-ups with the employee to see the behavior change. And the meeting and the follow-ups are very structured. The meeting walks from stating the problem through enumerating its impacts to letting the employee vent and often blame everyone else but themselves to brainstorming solutions and to mapping out a plan together. I hate interventions. It takes a lot of time I never have. It takes a lot of time for preparation, a lot of time for the meeting, a lot of time for follow-up. But Marty Brownstein claims that, well done, a problem employee will either turn their performance around or quit. And either one of those is an acceptable response. And it's a hundred times more humane and beats firing and formal performance plans hands down. If you're avoiding it, get help. Start with Marty's book, that's not enough, get coaching, but handle it. A problem employee in your midst seems interminable to the other members of your team. They all know it, and they think you're either clueless for not seeing it or not doing your job. So handle problem employees. So we've talked about managing down, about motivating, about recruiting, about handling problem employees. Let's talk about shielding your team. You want your team to live inside of a bubble. You want them enough exposed to the rest of the company that they can grab onto the mission, that they can leverage passion from the rest of the company. But after that, you want them to be able to get into the zone, to climb into the microprocessor and listen to the gates open and close, and not be buffeted by the torrent of corporate politics swirling around you. So I think of shielding your team as Star Trek's de being Star Trek's deflector shield or being Maxwell Smart's cone of silence or being this umbrella in the picture. An umbrella that's big enough to protect your team from all of the organizational politics. They may be able to see the torrent of politics out there, but they never get wet. Sometimes programmers see evidence of your efforts, but if you do a good enough job as their human deflector shield, they may never know the, the distractions that were flying their way. I had a team at Schwab where I had the, it was a really mature team, uh, and one of those team members, it was really a mature team despite the fact that one of those team members was only 21. He had been programming for a decade, more than a decade at that point, and he came to me one day and said, you know, I don't think we need a manager. And I thought about it, and I thought, well, they're a self-organizing team. They truly don't need me to tell them what to do 
But as I was in the shower the next morning, girding myself for the day, girding myself for the battles I would go into to protect that team from all the politics inside of any corporate environment, and Schwab was a pretty good one, protecting them was exactly what it was that I was doing for that team. They absolutely needed a manager. They had no idea. The challenge for you is to be a conduit for the mission and the passion and the strategy, even as you're shielding your team from much of the rest. So we're going to move on to managing out and, and especially uh, managing up. Uh, Ron, a quick question came up from yeah. the audience. Absolutely. I think you, you explained very nicely this uh, the team where they, they say like they don't need a manager. So the question is like in today's world, can you touch a little bit about the role of managing manager, manager and a scrum master, right? Means both of them, they try to protect the team and minimize the interference and all that stuff. So where is that fine balance happens? Yeah, so you can think of it there. Um, uh, Henrik Nieberg in uh, Scandinavia has done a paper in which he, uh, he draws it out. The teams have a scrum master to support their, the teams, which include developers, not just developers, but testers and sometimes writers and architects and designers and, and, uh, and the product owner. The team has a scrum master to facilitate the teamwork inside of that team. Now, if you ask people what it is that a scrum master does, 90 percent, 90 some percent of them will all say, well, the scrum master removes impediments. And even the best scrum masters, well, it's a rare scrum master who can walk into the CEO's office and tell them that there's an impediment that the CEO has to, has to remove. Scrum masters generally will um, will escalate to managers, and managers have more organizational support and more organizational involvement and more organizational credibility that allows that escalation to happen and allows them to support scrum masters. At the same time, you'll see in larger organizations where you know the database people will generally report to a, to a, a manager who was a database developer. The um, uh, web developers will generally report to a manager who was a web developer. The back-end developers will generally report to somebody who wrote business logic. And in fact, that's those are the people who can support those programmers in their careers, who can create the best practices and share the best practices across, because those people will be divided out into multiple teams, in good cross-functional good cross-functional teamwork will have them divided out into multiple teams and they come together in, as the staff of a manager. So I would note that I've given a whole talk on uh, to this audience on um, if we're agile, why do we have managers? It was about a year ago. And I think that's probably um, uh, archived on your site, and yes. it's also archived at um, on the slideshare.com site and on my own site at ronlichty.com. So you can go look at uh, multiple talks that I've given on uh, subjects of Agile as well as and how how managers and Agile come together. Sounds good. Uh, another quick question came from audiences. Uh, they want to know, one person wants to know, if you can recommend uh, some readings or some articles uh, to, and how to learn how to deal with the politics of the company or within the organization. Do you have any uh, recommendations or? Um, uh, yeah, well, um, one, of the, one of those recommendations, of course, will be to start with, with our own book. Um, we, we deal with the politics of the organization both in talking about developing a programming culture because of, and, I, and I'm about to talk about that so I'm going to hold off on that for a moment um, and we also talk about it in terms of managing up which I'm about to talk about so let me jump into that okay so two of my favorite rules of thumb about managing up Jim Cousins said the single most important leader in an organization is your immediate supervisor fact is your boss is the most important person in your work universe and Joe Falkman said, you can safely assume all perceptions are real, at least to those who own them. And the truth of this is it doesn't matter what you do 
it's all about your manager's perception of what you do. You, when you become a manager, your work is much less measurable than it was as a programmer, and you're now in the world of communication. And I urge you not to kid yourself. You're in the world of spin. And you need to make sure that you are communicating to your manager regularly, thoroughly, effective, effectively, so that their perception matches what it is that you do. So managing out and up, remember that I said that as a programmer, you have a very narrow view of your manager's job. And I also said how what makes you successful at one level isn't what makes you successful at the next. So managers' relationships are much more subtle and challenging than our relationships with our managers as programmers. At some point, as managers, our bosses won't be technical and will likely never have been technical. Or we'll have managers who are once technical but seem to practice selective forgetfulness. They seem to have forgotten all the rules of software development. And we'll have peers who are different kinds of people. They are from marketing and finance and sales, and they speak a dialectic of their crowd, their tribe, their specialty. As an analogy, I had a colleague who came back to work in the United States after years as an expat in France. He had been fluent enough in French that he could take on technical translation projects from French to English. But he noted that even fluent in the, in the French language for years, he was an outsider to the humor. I've had that experience at the, conf at the conference table when my peers were all from sales and marketing and finance and the CEO. Your peers and your manager become a challenge because they're, they're not technical or they don't remember being so. And they may pressure you to take on futile ineffective or even counterproductive activities like micromanaging or proving your team's productivity or reducing your team's slack time to zero. So let's talk about a couple of those. Let's talk about productivity. So this is a nugget of wisdom that was about Bill Atkinson, one of the early programmers on first the Apple Lisa and then the Apple Macintosh. Bill Atkinson wrote a majority of the original code, if not all of the original code that formed what's called QuickDraw, which is the underlying routines that if you're using a Mac, they paint the all of the icons onto the screen, they paint the menu and the menu bars, they paint the trash can, they, they deal with all of that graphical user interface. And Bill, one day, his manager came to work and said, we're going to count how many lines of code you're writing as a measure of your productivity. That week, Bill Atkinson decided that he was going to fix QuickDraw. He was going to make it faster, and he was going to make it more efficient. And by the end of the week, he had reduced the previous week's code by 2,000 lines. And he duly reported to his manager that he'd written minus 2,000 lines of code for the week. Lines of code are not a good way for identifying how to be productive. In fact, in my experience, there is no measure that proves a programmer's productivity other than its manager's observation. Bill Gates once said that measuring software productivity by lines of code is like measuring progress on an airplane by how much it weighs. Adding lines of code or adding metal to an airplane does not make it better. So could we, those of us who are agile, could we use points? Could we use velocity as a measure of productivity for our teams? Well, only for the team it was, it was, it created its measure and only as long as that team remains stable. And the second we start measuring points, teams start scamming points. One of the truths about metrics, one of the truths about what we measure is that it's sort of Heisenberg's principle of metrics, is that if we as managers start looking at it, our teams, the human beings on our teams will start gaming those measures. And fundamentally, customers don't care about points anyway. What customers care about is are they getting 
functionality that delights them. So the only measure of productivity that I've that's occurred to me that, that I'm interested in measuring, and it does have some side effects, but maybe measuring the output of stories. So at least stories are something that customers care about. And I've had the experience of seeing teams that say to me, we can't get our stories any smaller. So smaller, tighter, smaller, more succinct stories are a good thing. And I've seen teams say, we can't break, we can't split our stories any further, we can't make them smaller. And the second somebody starts measuring the number of stories, suddenly stories get smaller. It's a very interesting thing to have happen. So with that, I'm going to move on to talking a little bit about capacity. So your managers and peers may push you to fill your team's plates to capacity. They'll say things like, your programmers were just sitting around, or, uh, you know, the parking lot was pretty empty at 9 o'clock this morning, or you need to give them more to do. So without even getting into the overhead cost of multitasking, look at the picture and tell me which of those streets is filled to capacity and which of them has slack. And on which of those two streets do you want your pizza delivery to occur on? You know, for some odd reason, there's something that software development and pizza delivery have in common aside from feeding your team. Slack is a really important thing for programming teams to have. So let me move on to establishing culture. There's not enough time in this session to go deeply into this topic, but I want to give you a few thoughts to think about. Yeah, uh, not a quick uh, question from an audience as you cover this uh, culture uh, topic as well. Uh, the question is, are fear of failure and micromanaging strongly related? So basically, the first time managers they f uh, fear uh, failure, and that leads to micromanaging their team. So what's the core relationship? If you can touch a little bit about that part. Yeah, so I haven't gotten into the psychology of what drives micromanagement. I've more gotten into the effects of micromanagement. There's nothing that there is nothing that blocks teams from being agile more than micromanagement of managers. Um, if you think about it, what Agile asks is for every member of a team to step up and what micromanagement, the effect of micromanagement is that it causes every member of the team to step back. Um, I think that one of the, so I'm not going to the psychological cause, but one of the causes of micromanagement is lack of training. It's we were good as programmers and we never got training to be managers. I was a terrible first-time manager. My, I, I came into managing none of the micromanagement side, but on the sink or swim side, because every manager I'd ever had was a sink or swim manager. Though my first role as a programmer, my I walked into the office, this is a two-person company I was describing earlier, it had been a one-person company. My boss said, Ron, welcome. Uh, your first job is to translate this program that I wrote, that is um, the word skanky, I had the word skanky all over it, this program that I wrote, it's in an assembly language that you've never used before, and I want you to translate it from that into a higher level language that you've never used before, but you'll be fine. And by the way, I'm going to Phoenix for two weeks, and I'll basically be incognito for the two weeks, but I'm sure you'll have it done by the time I get back. That's a sink or swim manager. And all of the managers I had before I became a manager were like that. And I thought that was what manage, management was like until I was a couple of months into management at Apple, and I went off and took a class the Apple Apple had the benefit of having management classes, and so after becoming a manager, I began getting some training in management. Apple had a class called Situational Leadership, in which it basically laid out that continuum. It, it wasn't in that kind of a way, but it laid it. It basically gave me that picture of that continuum from 
of, of micromanagement, which I knew I didn't want to do because my dad was like that, and sink or swim, which I had thought I wanted to do, but it pointed out the, the, what I was doing to my people from doing that and really taught me the essence of delegation. And so it's, I think it's the lack of training that causes managers to stick with. It's, it's, it's because they had managers like that that managers repeat that. It's the, they're the role models. But it's the, it's the lack of training that causes them to stick with it. I think that makes sense. Thank you. So let's talk about establishing culture. So as I was saying, there's not enough time in this session to go deeply into managing culture, but I want to give you a few thoughts to think about. What your company says and what your company does may not match. So your company may or may not live its mission and value statements. So um, those of you who have been around a few years remember Enron. Enron had just an amazingly powerful, positive mission and value statements, and they totally didn't live them. So that's the first thing that you want to do is understand whether your company lives its values. And then secondly, you need to think about what's the culture your programmers need and how your programming culture and even the best corporate culture will almost certainly not all match. So you may have to wall off parts of the corporate culture. It's likely corporate cultures are likely to be written as in, in a heroic kind of way because they come out of sales, sales and, and programming cultures need to support Programming is a team sport, and so you'll almost certainly have to establish and bolster the parts that your company doesn't provide. And you need to let So here's a, a particularly potent rule of thumb for establishing culture from a, a particularly insightful engineering manager, Juanita Ma, here in the Bay Area publicly reward or acknowledge engineers who act in a way that supports the culture you want to create. This is really important. So again, we thought culture important enough to devote an entire chapter to it. And now let me talk about communicating. I noted the change in becoming a manager from introversion to extroversion. It's more. It means communicating. It means encouraging your team to communicate. It means creating a culture of communication at every level, a culture that encourages and rewards your team to communicate more and to communicate earlier than later, and encourages communication within your team and across teams and across departments and to your bosses. Communication is not only about talking, and that's a mis mistake many of us make, but it's also about listening. Kimberly Weefling said, we have two ears and one mouth. Use them in this ratio. It turns out when I began Googling this to see if she was quoting someone else, I found that she wasn't exactly quoting, but it dates to thousands of years BC that some Greek philosopher said something that was very close to this. We've been having to relearn this rule of thumb over and over and over. Frankly, nowhere is the need for communication greater than with distributed teams. Mike Cohn, in his book, Succeeding with Agile, had two interesting things to say about distributed teams. He said, um, he said that Scrum could make a co-located, could make, it, Scrum could make a remote team almost as effective as a co-located team. And then in another part of his book, he said, Distributed development will never be as effective as a co-located team. Both of those are true, but and companies like CenterZip were early adopters of Agile because they recognized that Scrum was the tool that would make them and their clients successful. Software development is fundamentally a team sport. We have to talk with each other. Mike lays out in his book some of the practices in Scrum that drive near co-located performance from remote teams. The transparency that delivering product increments every sprint provides. Transparency that enables easy pivots of priority. More communication. Guaranteeing 
agile guaranteeing quality both through automation and through shared definitions of done. The ease of pair programming across distance and the guarantee that scrum ceremonies provide that we'll come together as a team and actually talk with each other. So now that we've talked about all of what we have to do, why become a manager? I told you that I, be, that I, was, that I was tapped to become a manager at Apple and I managed a group for a year and a half before, as Apple was wont to do it, reorganized and eliminated my area of management. And I went off looking for another job inside of Apple. And the job I went looking for was actually being a programmer again. I opted to go back to coding twice. And I did that partly because of what a wonderful thing programming is. The ecstasy of getting code to work causes us to throw back our chairs and jump up and down with joy. Coding is way less complicated than managing and managers just don't get to go deep. But as a manager you do get to know you do get to go broad and the third time I became a manager it really took it, I really realized the benefits of being a manager. You get to affect more of the product. You get to affect more of the customer experience. You get to be in more of the conversation. Management is where the conversation happens. You get to mentor and coach and motivate a whole team to become something more. So here are a few more rules of thumb that I'll throw up on the screen and let you read them. If we had more time, we could also talk about topics like your role in delivering projects and products, uh, organizational problem solving, fomenting teamwork ensuring best practices, managing yourself, or the topic I talked to you about a year ago that I mentioned earlier, that talk is archived online, our, our role as managers vis-a-vis -vis Agile. But we're out of time and it's time to take some Q&A. So with that, let me note that, um, that, as I said at the beginning, video training based on our book was just issued um, was, was just released. It's on uh, Safari, O'Reilly Safari Network, or O'Reilly Safari Bookshelf, uh, as well as available from um, Inform IT, and you can find out about it on um, managing, the, managing the Unmanageable Not Net site, the book and the video training. Um, and you can find uh, mentoring, coaching, training, and consulting uh, available as well on the study, and, um, uh, and I train managers and teams in being, an, being Agile managers and in um, going from zero to Agile in three days. So questions for us, Pankaj? Uh, not at this point. Uh, so you can uh, forward the slides. And I encourage everyone to keep sending your questions through the chat box. And uh, I'll ask Ron as the questions come in. Uh, so thanks, Ron, for a great presentation. I hope uh, every time you hear about management, it does not matter how long you've been managing, you always learn some nugget of truth. So I found, I hope our audience also found some nugget of truth in the entire presentation. So really thanks, Ron, for a great presentation. Uh, everyone, please keep sending your questions. We'll make sure we, they get answered before the uh, webinar uh, runs out today, or we will get back to you with the responses. So uh, for, uh, for everybody else, this slide covers my contact. I am Pankaj Jain. I am the VP Software Services at Synergy. So if you have any questions or you want to follow up with me later about today's presentation or about Synergy, please don't hesitate to send me uh, an email. Uh, Ron, can you forward to the next slide? You bet. Okay. So at Synergy, we work as your trusted co-development partner for agile software product development. You get your own dedicated team of software and QA professionals. Mostly our clients come to us to address one of the following business challenges that they are facing. Some clients come to us because they want to accelerate their product roadmap delivery. Uh, but 
scaling the engineering team is a challenge. Depending on your geography, sometimes it's hard to uh, hire the people and it takes time. As Ron mentioned in, its, uh, uh, in his presentation, always be hiring. But sometimes business uh, needs uh, make them uh, scale faster. So the people come to, to um, uh, resolve that issue. Some clients come to us to address the uh, technology skills gap. Whether uh, the business needs uh, or the technology needs are in machine learning, big data analytics, .NET, Java, or QA automation. Whatever the skill gap uh, our VP engineering uh, or the business is facing, uh, and given our vast over 500 resources in software and QA professionals, we work in leading cutting edge technologies. So the client comes to us to fill the skill, skills gap. The third uh, uh, business reason they come to us is also to minimize the cost and the reduce risk. Uh, as as VP engineering and in management, the cost cutting is always a thing you want to do more with less. Uh, so they do come to us, and we do have a, a, definitely we are most of our clients, all of them actually at least save 50 percent uh, cost savings when they engage with us. And some clients start with us with the dual shore model, onshore and offshore, where we do have some of our resources on site as well. Next slide. I think we are running out of time, so we'll go quickly. Uh, I think this should give you uh, all of the audience like a good, uh, we have over 100 plus clients over the last 12 years, and you can see some big clients, and we work in different domains and all the cutting edge technologies. And I think we sh that's about it. Uh, let me see if I have any other questions. No, I think at this point we don't have any more questions. So Ron, uh, I really appreciate you taking time and all the audience. I found, I hope you found some a bit of truth. And I'm looking forward for to you, seeing you all in our future webinars. With that, thanks so much and have a great day. It's been a pleasure sharing a little bit of managing with all of you. Thanks, bye.